Good morning, good day, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from around the world for our final webinar of the 2017 World Interfaith Harmony Week. My name is Molly Horan, and I serve as Director of Communications for the Parliament, and I'm coming to you live from Chicago, joined by our speakers who are coming in from all over North America. Uh, today, we're fortunate to be joined by members of the Parliament's Indigenous Task Force and some special guests to have an important and timely conversation about the situation at Standing Rock Camp. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to welcome all of our viewers and all, all of our participants and share a little bit about the Parliament. The Parliament of the World's Religions is the world's largest, most historic, and inclusive convening organization of the global interfaith movement. Uh, when we say that, it's speaking to an origin 124 years ago in Chicago where religious traditions of the East and West first came together on an international stage, finding common ground enough to coin the term interfaith. Uh, when, we induce, when we introduce our indigenous task force, I'm gonna ask them each to reflect a little bit about their own personal experiences at past parliaments um, and these special gathering of indigenous people from around the world they've experienced, which is a very important part of our parliament history. Our mission, uh, the Parliament of the World's Religions mission, is to cultivate harmony among the world's spiritual traditions and to foster their engagement with guiding institutions in order to achieve a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world. Uh, we trace back to the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, the 1893 World's Fair, where that first historic convening of the World Parliament of Religions created a global platform for engagement of religions of the East and West. We're now headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, and we're an international 501c3 affiliated to the United Nations Department of Public Information. The Parliament hosts what's considered the world's premier interfaith convening in cities across the globe. Uh, we've previously convened in Chicago, Illinois twice in 1893 and 1993, then to South Africa where we met in Cape Town in 1999, uh, to Europe in Barcelona, Spain in 2004, then out to Australia in 2009, and most recently in Salt Lake City, Utah in 2015. The host city and dates of the forthcoming seventh convening of the Parliament of the World's Religions to be held in 2018 are soon to be announced. Now, we're meeting today over World Interfaith Harmony Week, which also uh, we, we'd like to recognize and uh, tell you a little bit about it's a very amazing uh, event that happens annually. Uh, started by United Nations resolution for a worldwide week of interfaith harmony proposed in 2010 to the United Nations by King Abdullah II and Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed of Jordan. This World Interfaith Harmony Week falls every year the first week of February. It aims to promote harmony between, people, between all people, regardless of their faith. Launching in 2011, this makes our celebration this week uh, part of the seventh World Interfaith Harmony Week. Its basis was called A Common Word, an initiative authored by Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed, released in 2007. It stems from the idea that humanity is bound together by two shared commandments, love of God and love of the neighbor, or as you may define it, love of the good and love of the neighbor. All the activities around World Interfaith Harmony Week happen globally, locally, regionally, and it's overwhelming the number of events posted this year to the calendar on the World Interfaith Harmony Week website. Uh, we're very grateful to all the organizations, civic society oriented, faith oriented, community oriented, taking on the call to promote interfaith harmony around the world. Um, as we begin today's session, I'd like all joining us uh, to know that you'll have time to offer comments and ask questions either through the chat function, which is on the right side of your screen of this business hangouts, um, and we'll address for about 15 minutes or so, depending on how it works. Um, if you want to contact us directly, you can feel free to email me uh, at molly at parliamentofreligions.org. We, we are joined by um, an unexpected, wonderful guest who spent a lot of time at Standing Rock uh, over the past many months, who's a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I'm not sure uh, if he's ready to join us yet. Uh, Chris, we have Case Iron Eyes. Uh, not yet, but he's on his way. He's on his way. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with the chair of the Parliament Task Force, uh, Louis Cardinal. If you're familiar with the Parliament, he's a face that you know. 
Uh, he's a communicator and educator. Lewis has dedicated his work to creating and maintaining connections and relationships that cross cultural divides. His work mirrors his personal vision of a socially just and responsive, responsive society. His long track record of public service includes being a founding board member of Racism Free Edmonton, founding board member of Alberta Aboriginal Arts, co-chair of the Aboriginal Commission for Human Rights and Justice, and being a longtime trustee here at the Parliament of the World's Religions. He's been awarded. He's received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for Public Service, the INSPIRE Award for Public Service, which is the highest award given to an Indigenous person by the Indigenous peoples in Canada, the Province of Alberta Centennial Medal for his work in human rights and diversity, the Distinguished Alumni Award from Grant McEwen University, and he was recently conferred an honorary degree of Doctor of Sacred Letters from St. Stephen's College at the University of Alberta. Lewis runs a consulting company called Cardinal Strategic Communications, specializing in Indigenous education, governance, and communication. Most recently, we worked very closely together to put together the Indigenous Peoples Program of the 2015 Parliament of the World's Religions. It was an ex exciting experience for everyone, uh, Indigenous, non-Indigenous, from 50 different faiths and 80 different countries around the world to witness something very special in Salt Lake. Um, I'd like to ask Lewis now to tell us a little bit about um, his work at the Parliament and how it led him uh, most recently to the Sanilak Sioux, Sioux Tribe uh, camp where uh, he was able to deliver a declaration on behalf of the parliament, but also uh, stand there in solidarity and witness in action firsthand um, and tell us why this is so important for the parliament to be working on um, focusing action, calls to action for the indigenous communities gathered in Salt Standing Rock. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Molly. Hello, brothers, sisters, and relatives. I hope you are all doing well on this glorious day. Uh, I know I am, and I'm very honored to be here spending some time with you and sharing some of my thoughts and some of the experience that I had at Standing Rock. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my, my sister, uh, Mary, for being with us today. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see you again. Uh, last time we saw each other, we were in Standing Rock uh, speaking at the uh, Sacred Circle. So I'm very, very honored to spend time with you then and again to spend time with you as well. And, and Chris and Andres, it's really good to see you again as well, uh, both uh, brothers in arms and uh, brothers of heart. So uh, I think that that kind of already leads into a part of the importance of the work that uh, the parliament does. Um, I, I went to the first parliament in, um, in Melbourne in 2009 and then uh, to uh, Salt Lake City last year. And uh, I think that I could say quite easily that it was uh, a highlight uh, of my life to be able to sit in circle and in council with uh, so many people with the same spirit, that spirit of working together like, like we should be as human beings and looking towards a future that that serves Mother Earth and, our, and all of us and all that lives on it in, in, in the right and proper way. And I think that the contribution that the Parliament uh, is making and working towards is ensuring that the Indigenous voice and Indigenous ideas and worldviews are sitting alongside other religious traditions and worldviews uh, and how we can work together as brothers and sisters on, on this planet, which is in a, a critical situation. Uh, at Standing Rock, um, the most immediate feeling that I had when I arrived at uh, Oseti Sakuin uh, was that sense of spirit, uh, the sense of humbleness, yet an intense amount of love and, and positiveness. Even though we were being buzzed by helicopters and the presence of the military were just over the hill, that was always there. But I think what was really important was that we all came together, not only as indigenous people, but other people joined us from all over the world as well, from all stripes, creeds, customs, traditions, and knowledge bases. But we came together single-mindedly, and that is to protect our water, to protect the land, to protect these things for future generations. And there were always ceremonies that were going on, so there was always that that sense of the sacred being there with us and to hear the many different prayers that were offered at the sacred fire really lifted the spirits of so many people. And when 
we heard the news that the president had um, put an injunction in on the uh, on the drilling sent through the camp a tremendous amount of joy but i recall that there was an uncertainty at the beginning of that because we really didn't believe that something like that had been had had been decided in our favor as you know it's very very rare that indigenous protests win uh, in that case so there was always that there was that cautiousness but that's what stayed with me was the sense of caution yes we were happy yes we we did celebrate but we also prayed because there was also a tone of caution in the air that caution for me now has turned into fear um, a lot more intensely you know, considering the recent uh, administrative administration shift in uh, in the united states and the recent developments here in canada as i speak to you i'm speaking at the headwaters of the black snake uh, which is uh, Alberta. A lot of our oil is coming through that territory and also will be making its way over the mountains into uh, southern British Columbia, where more pipelines are going to be built, or at least the intention is that they're going to be built. So this caution and this fear is elevating because governments on both sides of the border are still moving forward with the idea of moving these pipelines and the oil to their to their destinations. <coughs> And now that these uh, pipelines are being moved forward, our indigenous people are also starting to raise their voice as well. And because of the direct, uh, inter, uh, di the direct action that the, the uh, governments are taking, I fear that um, uh, military uh, action and or direct violence is going to uh, uh, affect our people more and more. So that's where the, the fear is, is, is in me. But I have confidence. I have confidence that our people and other people will hear what is going on and hear in the in their heart what they need to do to work together to make this a better place for all of us to live and for future generations. And that's the most important thing I think that we have to work towards. It's our responsibility today to speak for our children in the future and to ensure that they have good water and clean air and a clean land that they will inherit. So I'll leave it at that for this moment and hand it off to the rest of you. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Oh, thank you so much, Louis. I hope uh, I hope we're joined by many people who will hear that call echo. Um, the Parliament uh, itself has issued a statement that I think it's timely to to share. It came out in November. It was carried by by Andres and yourself uh, to the sacred fire at the Stony Rock camp. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit about that. Um, I'm gonna read it actually. Uh, the parliament of the world's religions denies any purported rights of the Dakota Access Pipeline to trespass on, build upon, and sub subsequently endanger the sacred land and water of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation. We do not speak for the peoples whose sacred sites and waterways are under attack, instead, we respond to a call from our 2015 Parliament keynote speaker, Chief Arvo Looking Horse, keeper of the sacred white buffalo calf pipe, and we are inviting you to join us in answering his call. He said, quote, what we are being faced with is a dark spirit. All life cannot afford to allow the same mistake to be made any longer. Look at what's happening to the four directions in the contamination of Niwakoni, the water of life. We are asking the religious leaders to come support them and stand side by side with them, the protesters at Standing Rock, because they are standing in prayer. That's just a segment, and I'll read more as we go along. But first to answer that call from the parliament was Andres Corbin Arthen. Andres is joining us. Uh, I'd like to introduce him. He's the spiritual director of the Earth Spirit Community, a religious and educational organization dedicated to the preservation of Earth-centered spirituality particularly in the indigenous European traditions. He is also president of the European Congress of Ethnic Religions and serves on the board of advisors of the Eco Spirituality Foundation. He's been a presenter at many interfaith events, including the 1993, 2004, 2009 parliaments, as well as the 2015 parliament and the 2007 World Interreligious Encounter. Of Hispanic origin, um, Andres teaches and lectures on the indigenous European pagan religions throughout the United States and abroad. Currently, he serves as a member of this indigenous people's task force of the parliament and our vice chair, 
So it was very meaningful for us that he was able to go to Standing Rock. Um, he's wrote, he's written extensively um, a long piece about his, his time there and his reflections. Um, it's been a couple of months now, and I'd, I'd invite Andres now to tell us a little bit about uh, what you took away and what you think people need to hear now. Sure, thank you, Molly. <clears throat> um, I'm very glad to be with you this morning and with several of my dear friends. Um, in, um, as you mentioned, uh, but well, we've all been hearing about Standing Rock for a long time, but back in October, um, Chief Arvo Looking Horse of the Lakota people issued a call to religious leaders to come to Standing Rock and stand with the water protectors and show their support. And so I felt the call as many other people did. And uh, the uh, the parliament at that point, the, the indigenous task force put together a uh, the, the declaration that Molly just quoted from. And um, I went in, um, in early November to North Dakota with my son Donovan and uh, brought the the statement from the parliament to the uh, the water protectors there. Um, what I took from that visit, uh, though it was it was a brief one, was what well, the first thing that struck me was that we were in a highly militarized zone, that there were not only police but but military vehicles, armored vehicles people in, in riot gear and uh, what I assumed were probably paramilitary uh, organizations that, that were hired for security. Uh, but the, the entire drive from Bismarck to the, the, the camp to, to uh, Osheti Shakowin, um, was had that feel to it. And um, in contrast, the camp itself felt very alive, very vibrant, full of people who were clearly deeply committed and had a clarity of purpose and were, were standing up to not only to, to the, the, um, the force to push this uh, pipeline through indigenous lands, but I think in many ways, it really was an event that was part of a chain of events um, that um, actions that have been perpetrated by the US government and by um, large corporations against indigenous peoples in this country um, for and have for a very, very long time. I think that it's fair to say that the way that American Indians in, in North America have been treated by the US government uh, would be considered genocide if this happened in any other country in the world. And I think we ignore that at our peril. Um, so I, I, I was concerned because it felt like in many ways, Standing Rock was potentially a powder keg. It felt that I felt a lot of resistance, a lot of resentment, a lot of anger on the part of the the the, the law enforcement and military people there. And I was concerned for the protectors that at any point the situation might escalate and that um, someone might get shot. Um, given where circumstances are now with uh, the, the, the current political situation, and some of the plans that are being made to continue pushing this pipeline and other pipelines, I can only imagine that we will have a number of standing rocks all over this country. And uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about the escalation that could lead to, to fatalities at Standing Rock or some of these other places. And I think it's important to, to marshal public opinion um, and and for the, the the various religious organizations to come together and take um, take strong action to to bring this concern to the American people and to try to like you know help people take the blinders off and see what is really happening in this country and has been happening for 
for a long time where indigenous peoples are concerned. Um, so I think I'll stop here and uh, we can talk more later. Thank you, Andres. I'm gonna ask uh, Chris if you've been joined by Chase Iron Eyes yet. He's with us. You know, it's, it's um, um, you have to bear with us a little bit. We were at a, an event late last night and things are moving kind of slow this morning. That's okay. So he, he, hasn't, he hasn't arrived at this moment? He is, he hasn't arrived this one. No. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our next speaker then will be Mary Lyons. Uh, and of course, I'm going to try my best to say that she's an Ojibwe elder. Um, she was a guest at the 2015 Parliament uh, keynote speaker at our Indigenous uh, plenary as well as several sessions as, as part of the Indigenous grandmothers. Anyone who was there uh, has to us and what an incredible connection that they made um, with the indigenous grandmothers. Uh, she's a storyteller, a senior medicine, senior member of the Top Hat Medicine Dress Long Skirt Society. Grandmother Mary carries an intense professional portfolio. Her contribution to the wellness of women and families stands at the forefront of her commitments in the areas of talking circles, ceremonies, vision interpretations, one-on-one -on -one spiritual guidance. Uh, so we have her today to give us one-on-one -on -one spiritual guidance. And she's been spending a lot of her time going back and forth to the Standing Rock camp. Uh, as soon as uh, I see that you're unmuted, I'm going to welcome you, Mary, to the floor to address us and tell us about, uh, well, what you've been telling me about unity and so forth. Welcome. Good morning in my language. Um, First of all, I'm very humbled and very honored to sit in the circle with these uh, prestigious people and also the viewers that are out there. So uh, I want to say welcome to each and every one of you. I'd like to first start off on sharing my experience at the Parliament of World Religions because prior to even entering my foot into this, this forum, um, it was real risky for me because I'm an a elder, I'm a Made at a very high level and I stepped away from our uh, grandmothers to go on a journey that this path was set before me and uh, just not knowing where I was going to go or what was going to happen, uh, Freedom Credit presented itself uh, to us and we entrusted that. Um, I encountered uh, many other uh, grandmothers in this stuff along the way throughout the globe and we seem to team up as the global indigenous grandmothers of the sacred we we really never uh uh tried to identify ourselves other than just a bunch of kukums bunch of grandmothers right and uh one thing led to the next and uh, myself working with the uh, women of obriety uh, believing that the the first invisible snake to our people and people of this globe is alcohol because it uh, it's, it's just never done anybody any good. It is just really, it's just not a good thing to have within this body. Um, so when we went to the parliament, being a little reluctant and being an elder and um, being an individual that was from the boarding school eras and this stuff coming all the way through, I, of course, I had a lot of uh, anxiety, distrust, and not only that, I think the world needs to know on this free land, our land, is that we were the last to be recognized within the uh, faith world because uh, it was in the late 70s. Otherwise, we would have been in violation of many laws that could have endangered our lives. So we stayed silent for a long time. And a lot of our uh, Madei, the real old Madei, they still stay silent. The young ones are moving forward because they don't want our religion to be forgotten. So I was blessed to be with the uh, Global Indigenous Grandmothers on platforms there and shared with every religion possibly in the world. And I just can't tell you what a, a, a life change moment it was for me. And, and also to be one of the speakers within the um, Women's Forum. It was an honor um, to stand within my truth and to speak my truth 
because I knew speaking, I'm just nothing but a hollow bone that speaks and carries the messages through of our people and our ancestors that walked before me. During this time, I heard Lewis speak and say, yes, we can, yes, we will, into a lot of the, I don't want to say proclamations or what it was, but the commitments to us as indigenous people really resonated through me. And for some odd reason, these were messages that were imprinted within us prior to it, and we were just getting these reminders. And so for some reason, you just know you have these people connected with people that connect with that and the spirit we move forward. Well, to move it forward, you know, um, a lot of us elders in a circle, we knew these things were happening. We just didn't know when or where they were going to surface at, but we knew the inevitable was to happen. And each one of us were to prepare ourselves on supporting the other great spiritual leader or people that are trying to move forward in a positive way. Us indigenous grandmothers were, um, the global indigenous grandmothers were sacred. We, we had our journey to Germany and up at the Netherlands and during water ceremonies and this stuff, there was breaking news and the breaking news and this stuff, uh, you know, in the Netherlands, in the papers and this stuff, there was Standing Rock. And in that picture there, there was these young people fighting off dogs that were biting them. And I had to look closer and there was my son, panic, panic because we knew this was going on prior to for me even leaving the country, but didn't know what the extent of what this would draw in. So when we got back to the States, I was so eager for information. I couldn't find nothing. There was, I, I grabbed the newspapers, there was nothing. I tried to lock into any of the radio, sound waves, NBC, main media, nothing. So when we finally made it up to Omega on another uh, journey that we were to be on, um, and finally opening my laptop and, and opening uh, Facebook, because when we travel, we try to stay off that type of media. But while we we're in the States, I opened it and was looking, and it was just pouring in. My Facebook was just what I was witnessing just put a fear through me. And I had this eagerness to, to reach there. And so I just was very panicky about time, but I knew time I had to be patient with until I could reach Standing Rock. Finished my uh, obligations there. And as soon as we got home, I prepared to do what I could to get there as fast as we can because the calling of the elders and our elder circles here and our phone calls and this stuff was flooding in and we had to take a moment and we had to stay within silence and we had to pray. During that time, my colleagues, the, uh, my uh, indigenous grandmothers and this stuff, Davy, bless her heart, uh, just, just when I needed to have that call, the phone rang and she said, we're ready to go. We're, we're here with you. She said, let us know. Let's get the date. Let's plan on it. So we moved ahead. So we ventured out, and when we ventured out, uh, um, we took my RV and we took a caravan of people with a caravan of supplies because I had messages all the way along the line that uh, the sheriff's office and the highway patrols and this stuff was confiscating stuff going into Standing Rock. Now, mind you, this was very difficult for my ears to believe this. So we went down through South Dakota and we came up that way. And when we landed there, um, it was very early morning. So we got to see just the real crisp daylight of what was to be an awakening because we found out at that time we were in the cradle of history. When we went in to Standing Rock, it was, we knew it was sacred. It was inevitable because our visions and all the night flying journeys that we had in this stuff was unfolding. It became to life because once we walked through those doors, going in there and met by the people in that there, it seemed we left our coat of color off and we came in within a spiritual entity of all these beautiful people. It was a 
very strong sacredness. Mind you, the people that was there, my expectations was to see Native Americans. I was expecting to see my brothers and sisters. I wasn't expecting to see global people from all walks of life. I was not expecting to see young people that were there greeting you with a smile, asking you if it's your first time there, if you're returning. Now, mind you, they were organizing. They were just now organizing this large group. And it's like nobody told anybody no that they couldn't do it. Everybody was helping out. We asked where we could park our rig and set, you know, set up so we can go around meeting and this stuff. And the responses we have, I just couldn't tell you. It was so overwhelmingly welcoming that we did. We found a place to set up do what we had to do in that there and go around visiting just to see, to hear firsthand from the water protectors and the people on ground to find out what was happening. We went up to Media Hill. They were, we were well informed. You know, we went to uh, the spiritual uh, circle up there and spoke with them and we just followed protocol just after and it was so beautiful. It was just, I, I, I told my grandkids and my great granddaughter, this is like a grown-ups camp I wish I could have always went to because it was so welcoming. And mind you, I took my family because my daughters and my granddaughters, my great-granddaughters, and them, they travel with me because they're, well, they're my students. They're, they're my helpers. And so that's when we're in the States or where we go, we travel together. So I'm going to hurry this up here because I know I'm taking time in that there from away from our other special people. Yes, what you did hear before, when we did look beyond those boundaries of the sacred place, the sacred circle, there was the ugliness of the military. There was this feeling of disbelief. There was the sensational glow and weight and heaviness of the uncertainty of what was to come. There was that. But yet when we stayed there, we knew we would return because each section of those camps and that there we visited, we needed to listen to see what they needed or what was coming up. We did not anticipate that it would even last this long. We just had really full faith in, in what was to happen with the president because he was there at Standing Rock. We thought his voice would have carried more of a message and sooner than what it did. So I was a little disappointed on that because you know, the, the people of this land, we have to fight every inch of the way. I, I, and I just don't know when it's going to stop. Uh, but one thing I can say, we're extremely resilient people. And we're not in this alone anymore because the people of the globe came together as the, win, as the oneness. So with that, I'm going to say, Kimi Gwit and... Uh, I'm happy everybody is on this call because this is a conversation I think we do. We do. Thank you, Mary. That was moving and a stunning reflection of your time um, and your time to come and your your welcoming to all of us who are not who are allies but who are not of the indigenous nations. Um, it's very meaningful. Um, to the parliament and important to, I can say very important to those of us who are gathered here in, in today's webinar, but anyone who's tuning in later because they, they've heard the call. Uh, I want to now ask uh, Chris Peters, <laughs> who is a member of the board of trustees of the parliament uh, to join us and share his reflections. Chris has more than 30 years of experience in grassroots community organizing. Uh, he's the CEO and president of the Seventh Generation Fund, uh, where he's been since 1989. And uh, he's a graduate of the University of California at Davis and Stanford University. Um, and he's now joining us uh, from British Columbia for a very similar, where he's gathered there for a very similar reason. Uh, they're, they're connected. And I, I welcome you now, Chris, to share with our audience and with us. Um, why you're in Canada and what you learned from Standing Rock that, that's brought you to Canada. Well, thank you, Molly, and, and uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to be on this webinar. And um, we, we certainly in, enjoy the relationship with the Parliament for years. This is my second run at the uh, uh, Parliament of World Religions. And um, 
have had some fantastic opportunities. And like Mary had mentioned, the overwhelming reception that indigenous thinking and indigenous philosophy has received with interfaith communities uh, has been um, outrageously fantastic. Uh, but with regard to Standing Rock, you know, and you know, I I could uh, share my um, observations, but I we we have a special guest here, and uh, it's Chase Iron Eyes, and Chase has been involved with uh, uh, Standing Rock for a long time, and is a prominent person there. And I'd like to yield some of my time to uh, uh, to allow Chase to uh, provide some updates on what's going on. And uh, mind you, Chase is just uh, recently. Um, uh, released from jail, you know, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Gestapo tactics at uh, Standing Rock has, has hit all levels, and uh, we're just very fortunate to have him here with us. So I'll, I'll uh, let Chase uh, provide an opportunity here to talk. So is the mic right here? No. Oh, they, can, they can hear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm very, uh, very honored to be here. And we're just happy to be able to uh, take a break from the front line, from the camps, the encampments that are still there. Um, you know, Standing Rock has become an international prayer monument. It's, it's not necessarily something that exists uh, in the physical form, the monument that is. The camps are definitely there, but it's been able, because of what we see as, you know, breaking the plane of spiritual consciousness, sending a voice, sending a prayer, performing the, uh, the rituals of drum, of song, or other gifts from the powers of creation. Because of that, um, you know, these, these powerful uh, sentiments and, and this upliftment in, in consciousness was made possible. There's no, there's really no other way uh, to explain it, and for an organization, and I don't know the scope of the Parliament of World Religions, but um, I just from my own, you know, interpretation of those words and what it could mean for the future of the planet, based on what Standing Rock has become, what it could become with the help of analysis and maybe the creation of content or, or statements or just the reformulating of what's happening there in terms of what it means to you who are on this call, who are on this board, and what it means to all of your networks. Because there is, there is something to be said um, by the world's religions, by... You know, those who, all of us who are on this spiritual journey seeking a spiritual liberation, there's something to be said there about the nature of that fight, about the recognition of water as a sacred entity, about uh, an economy that doesn't, you know, that, that is based off of, you know, religious and, and maybe academic institutions that don't necessarily value uh, what the West terms natural resources as the true sources of not only just, you know, the, the true sources of economic wealth, but also the, the true sources of our very sustenance. We don't, we, 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 don't we don't have a sacred or a direct relationship with our food sources, with our water sources, with um, the things, <clears throat> the things that, that a modern economy provides, and that leads to uh, a number of things. It leads to a lot of disrespect to things that are the original peoples of this world consider sacred relatives, consider um, entities to be respected. And so that, that, that fight that we're having there against, and it is a fight, it, it, it's, and it is against something it's against things uh big finance you know what, what currency and finance debt and um you know usury um and what big extraction means for the globe and and, and that 
it's imperative that the world's religions, that the world's thinkers and scholars and doers are able to uh, deconstruct what's going on there and provide that spiritual guidance. Because it's, it's not just those it's, it's not just those things, but it's, it's that economic reality that's propped up by those things, which is able to permeate every, the very psyche of almost every human being on this planet with consumer values, with the advertising industry, with manufacturing, what's cool, um, what's hip, what's beautiful, what fashion is, what to buy, how to buy it, the very system that uh, we, we are made to participate in. Uh, it, is, is it causes a cognitive dissonance with who we are as original peoples with spiritual instructions and duties to the universe. And so that, for me, I just wanted to throw that out there because that's what Standing Rock represents is um, this, this struggle that's a long time in the making. And, and, and there are light, there are forces of light and there are forces of, of dark or negative that have to be respected that indeed are part of you know, my, my people's cosmology, but which are usually recognized as, as entities to respect in any world religion or cosmology or even a, a mythology. Um, and so, you know, we, I am now, you know, there have been over 700 people arrested at Standing Rock. Uh, people have been permanently maimed. A late young lady, 21 year old New Yorker, got, almost had her arm blown clear off. She almost lost her arm. A lady uh, is blind in one eye from having been shot at close range with a less lethal bullet. A friend of mine had, has a huge hole in his leg about the size of maybe a quarter or a nickel, about an inch deep from one of those less lethal rounds. Um, people have been brutalized. They've been sprayed with water. They've had a, attack dogs sicked on them. And they've had uh, local law enforcement lie about it to the media and later th those lies were refuted by video evidence. And so the faith-based community around the globe represents probably one of the most powerful uh, movements, the most powerful allies, uh, and, and the most powerful uh, framers of what, what our world is going to look like in the next 100 years. Standing Rock represent, represents all of that. Even though you know I am, I'm facing uh, some prison time. Probably, well, I hope to beat it, but the, the maximum sentence is going to be five years for for inciting a riot. And so um, we really have to think about what 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 it, what does this mean? What does law and order? What does the modern nation state? Um, the corporate state, that set of institutions of law, economics, policy, uh, what is that serving? And, and, and who does it serve? Uh, we, need to, we need to weigh in on that. It's, it's hard to mix you know, politics and religion, but politics has always needed guidance from those who are seeking to answer to their consciences. And, you know, I... I I'm only human, I'm, I'm fallible, but I'd like to think that we're all on that journey. We're all trying to do that. But I just wanted to share that much. I'm happy to, you know, if there's any specific questions you have or any, anything you might want, uh, I can give you my contact information. Because of Chris and Tia, we're, our organization was able to provide a lot of necessary, much needed logistical and humanitarian support to those camps out there. But thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Chris. Uh, if you could stay with us for just a second, uh, can, if we could get Chris back just for a moment. Okay, Molly. Hi, Chris. Uh, I'd, I'd like for you, if you if you have a chance here, to um, ask a few questions of Chase that will drill straight down into the nitty gritty of what we can do. Uh, spiritually, he spoke very eloquently to that and, and, and practically framed the role of the faith-based communities, but if we can help right now, what do we do? Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we're, we're juggling back and forth with a head, headset here, so bear with us, too. 
you know, and 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 uh, I, I I I've enjoyed the postings of Patrick Horn, who's who's been uh, on the webinar, and and some of his his uh, comments have been extremely important, you know, from the declaration or from the the um, uh, doctrine of discovery forward. You know, indigenous peoples have been subject to uh, oppression and 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 genocide uh, because wrapped in that doctrine is is a concept that because we're non-Christian people, we are heathens and expendable, and that has justified the the conquest and the 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 uh, domination of our people and and uh, basically the stealing of our land and our resources. And that's where we're situated, and that's where Standing Rock originates from. It's not something that just happened overnight. It's been a long and continuous effort here. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, let me, let me uh, ask Chase here to, uh, to comment about what can people do? Well, the most, the most important thing you can do, as you know, is, is, is to send a prayer a voice uh, send it your energy and then after that there there are you know the camps are still ongoing we are still raising funds through seventh generation and also we are raising legal funds to pursue the legal claims that that derive from what chris just mentioned like the doctrine of discovery the body of federal indian law that that has uh descended from those those early uh, legal uh, th th their fictions they they're they're kind of like the mythology of of the West and but they provide a, a justification at least in in their eyes you know for the expropriation and subjugation of native peoples native nations but right now where the camps are it's 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 in a contested treaty area where uh, we haven't asserted our international identity there in about 130 years or, or some, you know, a long time. And so the camp is there and it's about to be raided. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers is saying that it needs to be cleared by February 22nd. And so I'm just now, I'm getting messages right now. I'm, I'm going to be called to Washington, D.C. tomorrow, it looks like to do some 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 press activities and to deliver some petitions to some high profile recipients but uh, we have a legal fund at lakotalaw.org we've uh, you know we're always accepting um, monetary support via seventh generation fund um, and there are there are other that we're working with all the camps on the ground out there and b besides providing a criminal defense we really want to hold Morton County for the civil rights, the constitutional rights, and the human rights violations, and assert a treaty claim because it is it is inhumane that that, that a legal, economic, and political oppression is holding a a people, a nation, in a form of bondage or uh, servitude. And you might you know you might have to study the doctrine of discovery in federal Indian law to to see the specific ways that, you know, Indians, because of their status in the eyes of Euro-Christendom, are not, they're, we are not able to hold superior sovereign title uh, because of our status as Saracens or, or Pagans or heathens. Um, we we, we uh, graduate and, and are limited to a usurfructory right where, you know, which, which is like the right of an animal to forage um, in, in, on the land. And, and so uh, there are specific things, I think, that the faith-based faith community can be in, begin to create th this other body of knowledge that, that pushes us toward a more respectful, uh, towards a, a more humane interpretation of the interaction of the different uh, cultures, religions, and, and cosmologies of, uh, of the planet. Uh, well, you know, we now we know we're all humans and we're all the same. But that that I mean, that's this, this is you're talking about 500 years of of all these institutions which which didn't believe that and which active act, actively actively uh, propagated the opposite of that, uh, propagated superiority. And so, um, it's it's that's what Standing Rock it, it does represent that. But it's just 
it's hard because sometimes the local governments, the local tribal governments, uh, don't necessarily realize the opportunity that we have to kind of change our trajectory. Uh, through the faith, through faith-based faith -based communities, with respect to the the legal relationship between Native nations and, and and the United States and and other nations, but it's it's available there, not only in terms of you know the the, the method by which we are recognized to hold land title, and it's called Indian title, and it's subservient to the supreme sovereign title that the United States claims through religious uh, rituals. And uh, we're talking about civil regulatory um, jurisdiction on the reservation that, that you know, outside the state of North Dakota is asserting in terms of taxation, in terms of, of uh, hunting and fishing regulation within the reservation on, on lands that have been uh, thefted from, from our uh, jurisdiction and, and our, our control. So uh, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of, of um, bridges to be built and, and dots to be connected. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm here to help that process. Thank you, Chief Iron Eyes. Um, a, a question that, you know, always comes up in sort of the interface setting when it comes to taking action is, do we stand going hand in hand and make rings of peace in places of danger against our fellow humans? And we've seen that at Standing Rock, um, but as, as tensions and violence and arrests and brutality and the potential for worse escalates, uh, would you call those courageous who are willing to stand with you to come? Or are our efforts best spent living out the parliament's mission of engaging guiding institutions to reframe the narrative as loudly as publicly as possible and through the trusted platforms of faith leaders who, can, who will be listened to um, to help, you know, reinform our public about what's happening and uh, why it cuts cuts against every moral fabric of every tradition we represent i, I think that's a great it's a great question and, and the, the question was as i understand it how how would i recommend the parliament and the world world's religion support either through you know institutional or, or framing a narrative or actually being on the ground um there, there was a powerful uh, religious presence back in, I, I believe it was October, and, and it, it really uh, it galvanizes the world because, because of who we are and, 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 and the, the, the spirituality that we seek, we look to our world's religions to provide that guidance. So, but, but it might, I mean, there might not be enough time for people to be on the ground. For anybody who wants to come and, and hold service, I mean, they're more than welcome to do that. We have people who can make sure that they're accommodated. But I think what's most important is that your networks uh, are able to voice their concerns, to, to voice their support for what Standing Rock represents. And, and, that, and, and that, for me personally, that goes up to and including, um, you know, supporting nonviolence, uh, being unarmed, and even not being aggressive in the face of corporate sponsored state violence that is inflicted on peaceful and prayerful water protectors this is a this is a different time it's a different day and age than than wounded knee for instance or or the oka crisis or gustafson lake or any number of indigenous armed struggles and we have, I mean, we're, we're kind of like the ghost dancers of the 21st century. We are only armed with peace and prayer and our spiritual convictions. But that is almost even more powerful than being armed physically. And so I think that's the most important place where the parliament can help out is activating a, a, a global or national uh, day of prayer, day of action, maybe on the day that the raid takes place something that we can create some some suspense and some drama and i, I don't i don't say that flippantly I, I say that because this is how pop culture works this is how the culture of the the internet works with people's attention spans are only last you know 90 seconds on a video and so we, we've got to be uh, aware of that thank you uh, i think i will go through all these comments and put, put them into a tangible action plan that the parliament can 
can lead up as we move forward. Um, we have seen a lot of comments coming through uh, during this webinar, during this hour. We are coming near the end of the hour. We want to honor the contributions of those who've gathered with us today. Um, two things that have come up. Um, uh, a viewer has asked if Mary Lyons will offer us a song or a prayer before we end today's meeting. So, if you can mute her. Oh, Mary, if you could unmute yourself. There you are. First of all, I'd like to say to uh, that young man, Chase Looking Horse. Um, Chase Iron Horse. Us elders got your back. Oh. Got your back. Whoopie, thank you. You know, we've been watching you for a while. My son's out there, my sister's out there, my niece, my granddaughters. And you know, the thing is, I think what they need to know is we've always been a people of oneness. Oh. I think what the world needs to know out there is that we're gentle, we're good people. Oh. And all we want is the same as everybody else wants. But right now, we're fighting for all of you because we are made of mostly water. Mm. Our spirit resides in this body that's made of mostly water. If you contaminate these wells, you're killing us. I can't see why this world cannot see that. When you put poison in a glass, that's intentional. But when you spill it into the oceans to kill people, that's genocide. Right. We're not doing this for just us. We're doing this for all. So I'd like to say, uh, short prayer for all of us, but young man, I want you to know that every elder circle, and even when we leave for New Zealand, the Maoris and this stuff, we pray for you, we pray for all the water protectors. You're not alone because you have all your ancestors in you. Well, I have a saying, and I'm going to say, get your money, do. Oh, I'll say good. This Please forgive, forgive us as we're pitiful people that only do the work of our ancestors entrusted each of us to do. We ask that we always see the truth through our children's eyes. We ask that we stand within our own truth and not harm others. We ask that our tongues speak the truth and continue to carry our ancestors' message forward. We ask that our spirits stay strong and awake to carry out our obligations that were given to each of us when we entered Mother Earth. Creator, Please awake the kindness in the angry people that carry their pain openly. Please watch over all the water protectors and all the angry ones that do not understand. May we move forward in hope, love, wisdom, and honor. Please, me what you want to do. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I just want to pause on that for a moment. Maybe we can we'll put together an email on ways to ask Andres and you to join us without without your mute buttons on so we can have a little open conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna start going through the questions. Um, we can't get to all of them, but we certainly will try as long as we can stay together. Um, we've had questions about uh, the media and media being lied to. Um, so who can we trust when we open our Facebook and we open our Twitters and our Google News? Who can we trust to tell us the truth? The Young Turks. The young Turks. Just one place. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. Uh, the Young Turks. I mean, our, our last real Indians is kind of like... It's, it's borderline propaganda for you know native nations and it's always favorable to native nations but young turks is like you know it'll it'll include the other side but it, it's always truthful it's never mm -hmm. yeah um what does the threat of the epa being dismantled mean to our sacred land <laughs> we're gonna be, we're backed up against the wall <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm so oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was going to suggest maybe you or uh, Andras could take on that question. <laughs> I think what it does uh, immediately. I hear the question. Let's have the question again, please. What does the threat of the dismantling of the EPA mean to the sacred lands? Well, I believe that it gives uh, justification for uh, further military action by the uh, federal government and the local state authority. You know, I, I think I think one of the big problems that we face is that Western Christian culture sees land as 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 an object, as something to be possessed, as something to be used for human purposes and it it has no intrinsic value by itself and i think most indigenous peoples of, of whichever part of the world uh, one of the, the defining traits of those traditions is to see the land as sacred the land as being the mother that gives us life and takes us back when we die and that we we belong to the land the land doesn't belong to us and i, th I think that's a fundamental uh conflict between indigenous cultures and mainstream western culture to whatever degree the epa provided some protection or has provided some protection for the land if that is now destroyed uh, it just seems like a, a giant catastrophe is going to face us <coughs> So a suggestion we've received is, what about a one day a week strike from all oil? That's always a good idea. Yeah, I think on the 17th, there's this national, maybe worldwide boycott of everything is shut down. And, and more people need to be uh, engaged in that process. You know, we, we used to do a campaign called Unplug America, you know, where we just sit down and, and unplug everything. Uh, for one day to give Mother Earth a rest, and uh, more of those uh, types of actions need to happen. You know, certainly a, a withdrawal from oil is is an important one. Well, I'm I'm asking those gathered with us to send in any last questions that they have, but I want to invite Lewis as our Indigenous Task Force Chair, um, and and Chris, who's now been telling us a little bit about before we joined today about what's going on in Canada to give us a few uh, closing words and some pointers about more standing work as we were discussing last night. Yeah, well, I, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Chase uh, Iron Eyes for being with us and bringing your message. Uh, I, I want to uh, let you know how much I appreciate and honor the work that you're doing for your people and for pretty much everyone else on this planet, considering the struggle that we're facing. Uh, as you pointed out, this struggle is greater than just uh, uh, just one community, it uh, certainly affects us all. And I think uh, Mary had a good message when we spoke yesterday about uh, a great shift happening and that uh, the action in um, South Dakota is, is moving us in that direction as well. But also my caution and fear, as I said before, being at the headwaters of the Black Snake up here in Alberta, um, the great concern, of course, is, is fear that more violence is going to be used against uh, the water protectors and any protector anywhere in North America as we begin to see the, uh, the creation of pipelines, um, the further creation of pipelines and the legalization um, that's taking place now, like removing the EPA uh, guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. These are all signs that um, corporate, um, the global corporate uh, mechanism is, is beginning to move and ready to move. So we have to be ready to take our action as well. Um, I do see the all, many little standing rocks uh, starting to take place across Canada and in the United States. Uh, and we have to create a broader alliance uh, throughout many of our communities. And I think um, through the parliament and the interfaith um, uh, groups across uh, around the world is that we have to bring this story. You have to bring the story to the congregations. The people need to understand that narrative. They need to understand why we are doing the things that we're doing and from where we are doing that from. It's an important action because through through knowledge and learning, we can have more of a chance to 
defend ourselves and defend Mother Earth. And of course, another action that we can do is to uh, lobby the journalists, not just the politicians. The media has a considerable amount of responsibility here, and we have to challenge them. But we have to bring the messages to individual journalists and editors and those gatekeepers that make the decision as to who listens to what and when. So we have to keep that pressure there as well. It's uh, equally as important. And again, I want to refer to uh, uh, Mary's statement uh, about Trump. Trump is not new. He's the latest version of the thing that we've been struggling with for the last 200 years or so. So I want to leave that open. And again, thank everyone. And uh, I'll hand the microphone back to everyone. Okay. Thank you so much, Lewis. It's uh, always worth it to get five of the most committed water protectors standing with the parliament on one hour together. I wish we had more time. And I think this, uh, this bears repeating um, when we can get our schedules together again. Uh, you bet. Doing more of this. Uh, I, I'd like to offer that we publish some written remarks that can be easily shared across social media and uh, some sound bites in today's call that we can use. Uh, and we invite everyone who's gathered to be with us on the Parliament's Facebook and the Parliament's Twitter, um, even more so on our website where we're communicating in real time. Uh, that's Parliament of the World's Religions on Facebook uh, and uh, at Interfaith World uh, on Twitter. Uh, sign up for our newsletter at parliamentofreligions.org. There's a pop-up window. You just need your first name and your email address, and we'll be in touch with you. Um, you'll be able to get a copy of the link to today's session. Um, and we just want to thank everyone uh, who's gathered. Reverend Selena says to thank all the other webinar presenters from the whole week, as this has been a whole week of Parliament webinars um, on strictly on climate change, on the dignity and human rights of women, and the interfaith movement as a whole, and where we see it going. Uh, we're not going to wait till World Interfaith Harmony Week next next time and we're not going to wait for more violence to erupt at standing rock before we stand in, in, in as forward motion as we can from the world's faith traditions uh, in lockstep with our indigenous siblings around the world uh so quite a moving call today uh, and i hope that we have a chance to get together again soon thank you so much uh, i think we're going to bring our hour, hour plus to a close um, but please feel free to email us if you want to connect with our speakers after after we talk today. I think they'll all be receptive to your comments and, and your questions and concerns. So um, wonderful to be with you. And I wish you all a, a safe and blessed journey throughout the rest of, of your February and 2017. May it be in your world interfaith harmony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.